Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Andrew Tabor, Executive Director of the Mountain Institute, which strengthens communities and mountain ecosystems internationally. Andrew began his career at the Wildlife Conservation Society, then the Wildlife Trust, and the Center for International Forestry Research, and was instrumental in establishing Bolivia's Gran Chaco National Park. He has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Andrew, for joining us. Well, thank you as well for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. So let's talk about mountain ecosystems. And it's, I'm just going to let you speak because it's the, just the description of mountain ecosystems and their place in our world is, is quite astounding. You know, I've, I've been at the Mountain Institute for about a year, and I found this an extraordinarily compelling opportunity professionally, but also because mountains are this major habitat type globally, which is really not receiving adequate attention in terms of the environmental, social, uh, and economic challenges they face. They cover about 25% of the Earth's terrestrial service surface, and they contain around uh, 750 million people. They're extraordinarily important in terms of biodiversity. Some of the richest areas on the planet in terms of diversity of species are there. You know, a thousand species of orchids in the foothills of the Himalayas, um, snow leopards, a whole range of extraordinarily exciting species. They also have incredibly rich cultures. Think Tibet, think the Quechua Indians, descendant of the Incas. Um, there's, a, there's a huge diversity of cultures. There's about a thousand languages spoken in mountain ecosystems around the world one way or another. And to top it all, in terms of challenges, they're really one of the places on the planet which are going to be most impacted by climate change. Temperatures are going to increase two to three times faster in high mountain systems than in lowland areas. We're already seeing major changes in those ecosystems. And it's extremely worrying in all sorts of ways, environmentally, socially, uh, economically. The consequences are quite serious. And we are really facing a situation in which these dramatic changes in our world, even more dramatic in mountain ecosystems, can, mm. can result in a collapse of entire biological ecosystems as well as cultural uh, traditions. That's, that's quite correct. I mean, there's a whole bunch of inter, intertwined processes going on at present. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest things about mountains, of course, is that they're a critically important source of water. So about half of humanity ultimately depends on water that comes from mountain sources, originally fresh water. So here we have the Potomac River, born in the Appalachian Mountains, the Himalayas, Hindu Kush Himalaya, where the Mountain Institute has been working for uh, more than three decades, provides water for about a billion people, more than a billion people in India and China, for instance. So, you know, the consequences of changes in those ecosystems will be felt by all of us flatlanders. Well, and also the mountain ecosystems have extracted water from the atmosphere and rendered that water in liquid form mm -hmm. from, from gaseous form. Right. Uh, we end up with a more humid planet. We also end up with a drier planet. Mm -hmm. We end up with a planet that, because there is not the balance of, of, of freezing and melting, Mm -hmm. We end up with a planet where the, uh, the cycles are much more dramatic. So it, it, it kind of cascades, it might start in the mountain regions, but it cascades throughout the lowland right. ecosystems. That's exactly right. And that's one of the big challenges. The organizations providing a range of programs, describe those programs that sure. are, that are sure. currently underway. The Mountain Institute's tagline is conservation, uh, community, and culture. And we have a fairly broad set of programs and approaches that we're using around the world. Although we're a medium-sized uh, nonprofit, environmental nonprofit, we feel that we need, we need that broad, integrated approach to really address the mountain problems. By focusing simply on one issue, we're not going to get to the roots of the whole range of issues that challenge mountain systems. The institution got started focused on environmental education, really, in the Appalachian Mountains. We have a a uh, environmental education center at a place called Spruce Knob, which is actually the highest point in West Virginia, and is, I believe, the darkest point uh, at night in the United States uh, uh, east of the Mississippi River, uh, which makes it quite, a, quite intriguing, quite a beautiful sight in the Appalachians. And we've got a program there that reaches out to, to kids, primarily Title I kids from impoverished schools in West Virginia. Um, so, and we've 
run that program for about 40 years. We reach actually a whole range of, of uh, children, both from, the, from poor public schools, also to uh, people from much wealthier communities. But it's a great opportunity to bring together those children so they can learn about the environment and appreciate what mountains provide. So it's that sort of eyes towards the next generation, in terms of education, teaching, and so on. That, that's been our sort of, that were our original roots. But since then, we've got heavily involved in a much broader set of issues. Uh, conservation uh, gets really to the core of um, our work to, to both protect cultures, to both conserve communities. You need, a, you need a stable, strong natural resource base. You need to conserve biodiversity. You need to conserve ecosystems, et cetera. The Mountain Institute played a key role, for instance. It was one of the first nonprofits in Tibet. Uh, it's been working for nearly four decades in Nepal. So one of the key things that we were instrumental in playing, was in playing a role in was working with the Chinese and the Nepalese government to create a huge protected area around Mount Everest and uh, east as far as, as Sikkim and, and into India and Bhutan as a sort of a coordinated conservation area in that part of the world. So very, very exciting work in terms of protecting one of the highest and most exciting mountain regions on the planet. We've done similar work in, for instance, in the Andes of Peru. We've been involved in things from species conservation to restoring highland forest ecosystems, a whole range of issues in conservation. Well, it's interesting because, in a sense, uh, by looking at not only the environments in which people live mm. uh, and which affect people, the conservation pillar, mm. you're also um, uh, addressing how conservation and how environment interacts with community and culture. Absolutely. How does an environment affect a culture? How is it affected by a culture? And in a sense, aren't you learning? You're, you're teaching, but you're also learning from the cultures that have lived in these environments? Very much so. And that really is the ideal segue to the, the talk about to addressing issues of communities. One of the key things we've discovered, and I learned from my own work in the Gran Chaco, for instance, is in the old days, a lot of this protected area work or poverty-related work and so on would involve the experts going into an area, bringing the solutions with them. And history has shown us that that approach doesn't really work. What you really need to do is form a real partnership with the local people on the ground, with the local communities. Be there long term. Learn what, what they know, what, what works, what doesn't, um, and also recognize that many of these mountain communities are extraordinarily adaptable, and they're trying new things as well. Right. Bring in the best science, the best outside knowledge, and I think melding those together, you can actually come up with more sustainable solutions. Many of these cultures uh, utilize the attributes of the mountain environment for various purposes. Mm -hmm. There is the use of the natural resource of water or the minerals or um, the vegetation for their livelihood. But there's also the utilization of, of cold and remoteness for just security and protection. Mm -hmm. There's the utilization of, of cultural resources for the purpose of of religious worship or mm -hmm. uh, tourism. And I think that, that it, it suddenly um, places conservation in a completely different light, in I a more right. ecosystems uh, light, a more comprehensive ecosystem I, light. I think that's right. I think that, that's absolutely right. And that, that is um, fundamental in some ways to, to our approach. Um, so while we're working with the communities to address a broad range of livelihoods issues, there are tremendous levels of poverty. Appalachia is one of the poorest parts of the United States, for instance. The areas we work in, Peru, in Nepal and Peru are some of the poorest regions in their respective uh, regions. And what we, um, what we discovered is that it's very important to understand, work with, and value their cultures. We've been involved, for instance, in restoration of uh, historic monasteries throughout the Himalayas. Um, we've been involved in restoring uh, ancient Inca trails in the Andes. We find that those kind of efforts are important for their own cultural heritage, but they also provide an opportunity for us to work with and really form bonds with the local people who recognize the importance of those sites. And then 
trying to figure out how, for instance, novel, innovative new funding sources, for instance, through ecotourism, can also bring benefits to poor mountain communities as well. And there's tremendous opportunities. How do, how do your finances work? Uh, is, is it primarily uh, American donors and, and American funding sources, North American funding sources, that are contributing and that and, and these other places internationally are consumers of those funds through various programs? Or is it more international than that? We have a diversity of funding. So a lot of it comes from agencies, USAID for our international work, and in the United States, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, um, with various Department of Interior and other, and other government agencies, Department of Education, for instance, the state of West Virginia. But we also get significant amounts of money, for instance, from the government of Finland, from the German government, for our work internationally. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got a diversity of agency funders of our work around the world in the U.S. We also get a significant amount of support from private foundations. So, for instance, MacArthur Foundation has been very generous to us in the past. Right. And we also depend, to a much less extent, on individual philanthropy. We do, have, we do have some individuals who have continued to support us for many years, and that's very helpful, particularly because it tends to be unrestricted funds that we can use most strategically. Are there any earned income sources that you, are, that, you're, that you have cultivated so far or plan to cultivate? Well, we're very excited about that. I mean, I think that is one of the exciting areas in the future, and I know that many nonprofits are looking at that. So, for instance... We're exploring REDD, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, as one potential funding source to support conservation in mountain areas in, for instance, Peru and Nepal. We're also, in some cases, exploring um, small village hydro projects, mm -hmm. maybe in, in relationship with um, uh, investors, green investors. Right. We're doing crazy things like uh, bringing solar panels to West Virginia, you know, where coal is king, and trying to introduce the idea and the approaches for alternative energy, alternative energy approaches for, for communities there. That's very interesting. Mm. How is that uh, uh, working out? Uh, there are some interesting openings there. We, we're particularly focusing on uh, the town of Morgantown in, 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 um, in West Virginia and are looking for some high-profile places with the municipality, with the city, right. where we can put solar panels on roofs of buildings and so on. So it'll be something where everybody can see it and begin to realize that, hey, wow, this is an interesting new technology. Maybe we should be thinking about it more. So taking solar power to coal country is an interesting challenge, but there's real openness uh, on the part of our, the, the, uh, the, the city of Morgantown and other people we're working with there. Do you ever find um, opposition to your programs as you as you move forward, or is it or is it pretty much embraced? I think in general, it's it is uh, firmly embraced. You know, we, we're a very gentle organization in the way we go about things, and many of the areas where we've been, we've been long term, so they know us, and for the most part, in outside the U.S., uh, most of our employees, most of the people that work for us, are local people. So the entrees to the communities are, it's very straightforward in terms of establishing the relationships and so on. We are, we've not been an activist organization, so we're not, you know, we're not um, heavily involved in, for instance, mountaintop removal mining or some of these. Right. Certainly those issues concern us very much, but our role is a different one. Uh, it's been more working with communities, education, coming up with solutions for environmental problems. Do you have people scattered throughout the world um, in terms of running your programs, or are most people headquartered here? In, in we States? are extremely decentralized. Our office here has a couple finance people, myself, a, uh, a development officer, uh, some interns, and for the moment, the head of our Asia program. We've got about 40 or so staff around the world. The bulk of them are either at Spruce Knob in West Virginia, or in, uh, in Nepal, um, or, in, or in Peru, in the Andes. Are you um, going to move beyond um, education programs uh, into um, direct intervention uh, programs where you have a permanent um, uh, um, uh, group that is located to, uh, for example, um, execute some conservation project uh, 
in a particular location, or is this not more, not so much your? Well, we we tend to have people on the ground long term in these places. So, for instance, we've been so the Cordillera Blanca in the Andes of Peru. It's the really the highest, most um, most impressive mountain range outside the Himalayas in terms of the the number of really high mountains there. And we've got an office and have had for I guess close to two decades now in the in the town of Huaraz and have continually maintained programs with local communities there t t you know, over, over two decades, people that have known us for a long time. We see these sort of sites as demonstration sites, so places where we can learn what works and what doesn't through these long-term relationships. And looking forward, I'd like us to see us doing much more uh, drawing out those lessons learned and communicating them so other places in the mountain world can benefit from the experiences that we've got. How do you staff those, those offices? Are the people who run those offices local uh, individuals? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, our, our Wadas office, in, in um, there's about eight people at present there, and they're, they're all Peruvians. And what does your board look like? Our board is a mixture of people, many from the Washington, D.C. area, not exclusively people from New York, uh, from, we have people from the development community, from major consulting companies and that sort of thing, from the diplomatic community, from business. It's a fairly diverse board. Any people from the, from the co countries where the programs are assigned? Yes. The ex-ambassador um, from Peru is on our board. We've had, we have people from Europe, um, so, and we've had in the past from Nepal and, and other, well, actually we still do have some people, have one person from Nepal as well, ex officio, but on the board. So what's next for the Mountain Institute? I'm extremely excited, as I, as I started off saying, you know, coming into this organization, which has a tremendous history, real presence on the ground, and huge needs in terms of drawing the world's attention to mountain systems and finding real solutions. I would very much like to increase the scale of our impact both directly through growing the programs uh, and even more importantly through networks of local partners on the ground. So I'd, I would like to see us growing a fair bit over the next five or six years and then I would like to see the really significant growth because challenges for mountains are huge. I'd like to see follow-on growth after that being much more in these local organizations in the different countries where we work. So fostering those chapters, fostering those, those or, or affiliates, affiliates, if you like. affiliates, yeah, partner and, organizations, and having them uh, develop and become perhaps more self-sufficient. Having them become more self-sufficient and be more effective, and I would like to, and the sort of the core would be the core of the Mountain Institute, would be a provider of coordination, sharing lessons learned. Uh, technical expertise, knowledge, clearinghouse, knowledge so clearinghouse, those sorts of functions. So are you, for, from a strategic point of view, at uh, fostering an inflection point at the Mountain Institute to, Very be, much so. to become a more internationalist organization? Very much so. I think that's one of the issues that we're dealing with. We're beginning a process now that I've been here for a year. I think we're, we're beginning a process now of thinking about our future strategic direction. And I think over the next six months or so, uh, I think collectively as a group, working with outside experts and so on, I think we need to resolve this and see where we're going. We also need to see what the funder community is out there. It's a, you know, it's, it's a, a, a tough, the, the economic situation is difficult. Right. Um, the problem I face is that mountains are full of needs. And, I've, and while I believe that small is beautiful, I think we need to be... We need to grow some so that we can more effectively fulfill our mission and also have greater uh, long-term financial sustainability. Well, we'll be sure to check in with you over the next years. And I'd like to thank you, Andrew, for sharing your experiences. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for your insights.